All right. So, well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for, for coming to my um, to my now, now uh, pre-recorded talk, just to be like everyone else and using an electronic prophylaxis. But um, yeah, so so uh, strategies for um, ab initio biomolecular uh, force field development. This whole idea of ab initio force fields has been very attractive for uh, at least fifteen years or so. Ever since essentially we had we had the the compute capacity to do the quantum calculations that would uh, describe any of these molecules that we're interested in, and so in the last um, in the last five to ten years, we've really started to see uh, rays of hope in this direction. So I want to start just by reviewing uh, the the differences between a small molecule force field, which a lot of the other talks have covered in I think great detail, and I've been I've been watching and very very impressed with a lot of the work that's being done in open force field. Uh, the small molecule force fields versus the biomolecular force fields. And you can see these differences manifest themselves even in the way they, um, even in uh, not just the fitting strategies, but even in the way people talk about their force fields. And then it becomes an, an issue, okay, well, how do we pair the small molecule force field or even like the, the third category of force fields or major category that I'm not mentioning here is water models, in fact. But um, you know, people talk about pairing the biomolecular force field with the water model or pairing the small molecule force field to the biomolecular force field. I think we just have to look at the details and the goals of what they're, what they're um, trying to model at first. So with the small molecule force field, you, you want to capture a space of trillions or thousands of trillions of potential molecules, chemical space. With the biomolecular force field, you have a much more limited palette. Um, I'm saying up to 100 common monomers because you think about 20 amino acids uh, in nature and then um, some modifications of those amino acids, phosphorylation and such. And after that, there's probably a few dozen non-natural amino acids that people are most interested in, even though there are thousands of um, theoretical, uh, you know, thousands of amino acids. So we're, we're talking really about a palette of up to 100 or maybe 200 uh, individual residues in a biomolecular force field. So with the chemistry in the small molecule force field, you have um, potentially a lot of nasty chemistry. You can have some toxicity, but you can have things that take a lot of energy to synthesize. And in uh, biology, you could have uh, things like, you can, you can have things like the, um, the uh, penicillin and some of these lactam rings you know, that are pretty highly strained. But really, uh, you're not gonna see quite the chemical diversity in that. And, and in, and the, the common theme being, of course, that these things are products of metabolism. They're also going to be recycled and broken down by metabolism. So there is a, there is a, a palette of chemical bonds and um, ways to connect these things. And of course, the, the ATP-driven processes that can create these things, there's a, there's a limited energy budget for making them. So then the key properties uh, for the small molecule for still become things like hydration-free energy as you want, you want binding-free energy. We, we want to know what the equilibrium constant's gonna be for this, for this drug binding or for this, uh, or even like the, the uh, properties of this neat liquid. Uh, we'd, we'd like to know how, you know, uh, not just benzene or some benzene derivative is going to um, solubilize uh, in CO2. Uh, then the biomolecular force field, we, we want structure primarily. We want uh, secondary and tertiary structures of polymers. We wanna see how, um, uh, Hydrogen bonding particularly uh, dictates the secondary structure and then how weaker interactions dictate the interactions of the secondary structures to fold into a uh, protein or an RNA uh, enzyme. And so this all translates into the ways we train these force fields. So the, the parameter libraries and interpolation strategies that I think OpenFF is doing very well to explore and to, uh, and to hone for the small molecule force fields. Uh, you, you see sort of an analog in the, um, the ways to, uh, to perhaps uh, have libraries and uh, we can start to think about you know, uh, bond order corrections and things for biomolecular force fields. But largely, the biomolecular force fields, because they are so sensitive to small perturbations and we, we're, we're seeing small perturbations create large differences in tertiary structures, whether your protein folds or not, uh, the biomolecular force fields, the strategy tends to be improve on something that already works, uh, modify uh, only a few parameters of it, and uh, throw lots of graduate students at the problem. <laughs> so then yeah, the validation strategies uh, being for the small molecule for skill validation is still uh, the bulk of the work. The, the generating the fitting data and doing the fitting is, um, is important, but the validation is uh, for either of these categories is quite lengthy. 
uh, the fleets of TI or alchemical binding free energy calculations, getting back to the, the goals of the model uh, for, for the small molecules. And then for the biomolecular force field, you're looking at microsecond timescale simulations. Uh, even the, the latest AMBER force field that I'll talk about in a little bit, uh, AMBER FF19SB, that was validated using um, five microseconds, so 5,000, no, no, uh, five milliseconds, 5,000 microseconds of combined um, uh, replica exchange simulations on various uh, helices to try and get those, uh, to get the helical propensities right. But then you, know, you can see things, other, other things on the microsecond time scale. Um, enzyme binding, uh, that can occur there, but mostly you're looking at NMR terms and NMR relaxation uh, constants. And so biomolecular force fields, in, in this sense, they've been pretty um, successful at replicating a lot of these things, again, on the microsecond time scale. And we're now in a regime where, uh, on the microsecond time scale, we can start to see these uh, enzyme binding events, these drug uh, ligand interactions uh, that are relevant to biology. So in some sense, the, the computation is ready now to, um, to have both force fields working in conjunction, in concert, and now it, it comes a question, can we, um, can we align the ways that we make both of these models? So a brief history of the amber protein force fields. This is sort of my stomping grounds. Uh, the amber protein force fields are a vaunted, a very respected um, uh, class of the, the biomolecular models, uh, particularly the protein force fields. It started in 1995 back in the late Peter Coleman's lab uh, with Wendy Cornell. You had um, Kenny Murs, you had Chris Bailey, uh, all in that crowd, and they developed the PARM94 uh, set along with the what's been called the Cornell charge set. So FF95 incorporated PARM94, which was the bonded parameters, and then the Cornell charge set was all based on 631 G star hartree fock calculations, which nowadays they, they take minutes, if not seconds, on a, uh, on a modern computer. Uh, it was pretty significant back in 1994, of course, but uh, that, that charge set, because it has some propensity towards polarization in certain chemical groups, it actually performed very well. And, it's, and it is still in use today, in fact, even in uh, FF19SB. So 24 years later, they're still using the same charge set. And what I've done on this slide is tried to indicate, you know, as, as seen in the legend here, if you have a new charge model, then you did a torsion refit. Maybe you did some Leonard Jones refits. So uh, Junlei Wang, uh, who's still with the Amber, uh, Amber group and the consortium, he started in um, the late 90s working on um, a derivative of FF95, became FF99, and it really took off when Victor Hornack uh, came in. So the, the hydrogens, um, particularly the hydrogen Leonard Jones parameters, got diversified by Jun May. But then Victor Hornack came in, and along with people like Robert Abel and, uh, and Carlos Simmerling's group, um, and Adrian Ruckberg was also involved in this effort, but this, uh, this uh, thing in 2006, the, the next torsion refit, when we started to incorporate more MP2 uh, level calculations, this became FF99SB, and this 99SB um, has been a, it was a very long-lived and very um, successful uh, protein force field, but really you have to recognize that it was a limited refit of what was already in FF95. And so then uh, uh, it got to as far as 2014 before James Meyer, also in Carlos Summerlin group, came along and did some additional torsion refits. They got even um, better reproduction of helicity and uh, perhaps beta sheet propensity, still using the same charge set, of course. Around 2014, 2016, we had sort of a flowering of different, um, different force fields. So I got in there and I, I made a complete refit of different charge set, all new torsion parameters and uh, my own, some of my own Leonard Jones edits. That first one actually didn't work very well, but a student of Lillian Chong's came along and I was able to work with him. I'll talk more about this uh, in detail, but in 2015, we came out with what's called now FF15 IPQ. So a successor to 14 IPQ, but in fact, a complete refit of everything. Um, and this one uh, got, uh, basically backtracked a lot of the Leonard Jones uh, refitting, but it got uh, the salt bridge propensities correct, which 14 IPQ really uh, was the Achilles heel. And so 15 IPQ and 14 SB, they, they are very much neck and neck. They're um, both very, very good force fields. And uh, our own Li Ping Wang in the Open Force Field Consortium came out around the same time. So there were essentially three very good amber force fields. Li Ping made uh, a complete torsion refit, not a limited torsion refit, but a complete one of, um, 
all the uh, side chains and all the protein parameters. Uh, but again, still keeping the uh, Cornell chart set. So I sort of put him as, uh, as a branch in that original line, whereas the, the Dewan force field, which has since been modified by Robert Best and uh, later D.E. Shaw group, and then the IPQ line of force fields over here on the very right, which I kind of started and Carl Debiek um, uh, really did an excellent job on. And since um, I've just uh, been um, involved in writing a manuscript for uh, Anthony Boghetti, so um, Italian cars um, and perhaps Italian force fields, we're gonna say they're very well made. Um, but uh, uh, Anthony Boghetti and another student with Lillian Chong, they've made another 900 parameters uh, torsions and uh, new charge parameters for uh, unnatural amino acids. So I'm really actually very pleased with their success. I, I helped them through generating about the first 30 of those parameters, but I'm very pleased that I didn't hear back from them thinking that maybe they'd drop the project and all of a sudden, no, in fact, they finished it. They didn't need my help. So they needed my program, but not my help. And I was very happy about that. But there, so there, there's a, quite a, a crop of uh, force fields within the AMR community. And it's, it's remarkable how long lived uh, one of the charge sets is, but we still have uh, many options for many different ways we can go. And so um, the, the thing I'm gonna talk about is the uh, branch that I started back in 2013, 2014. So this IPOQ, the IPQ line of force fields. Um, this idea uh, started with uh, Kara Marzanis and it goes all the way back to you know, something in the around 2000 or so. Um, um, from some work by uh, a fellow named Stone. But um, Kara Marzanis took a look at a set of dipoles and or just imagine a theoretical set of dipoles that's in, a, in an electrostatic field strong enough or, or generated by things that are large enough. It's basically like in a temperature controlled bath that this is an electrostatic field that the charges do not reciprocally influence. And if you look at the way those charges, if they are inducible dipoles, if um, you allow them to polarize to equilibrium, and then you look at the energy of that system, you realize, ah, in fact, what you have uh, is, is the energy of a system of fixed dipoles as if you had just taken the uh, configuration of the polarized dipoles, neglected the fact that it took energy to polarize them, and then averaged that with the energy of the dipoles in vacuum phase. So, transitioning to the monopole systems we've got. In fact, uh, the, the argument became what we should do is um, compute the polarized charge distribution, neglect the fact for the moment that the energy of polarizing is not trivial, and then average that polarized charge distribution with the vacuum phase charge distribution for the same molecule in the same configuration, and thereby account for the polarization energy difference in the fact that the charges of our fixed charge model did not polarize to the full extent that they would in the polarized model, simply because we have to account for that energy in some fashion. And this idea is one that's um, sort of gained a lot of traction in various circles. Other people have made edits to the IPOQ force fields, but particularly the, uh, the open force field team has, um, has taken this a little bit further, making it a sliding scale. How much do we mix the polarized and the, uh, the uh, un unpolarized, the vacuum phase uh, charge sets. How much do we mix them? And the mixing parameters they've come up with are around 0.4 to 0.6. Uh, and leaning, in fact, towards the, um, the polarized charge distribution, which uh, I'm not going to talk about too much more, but uh, which seems to be easier to fit. Uh, electrostatic potential fits of a polarized charge distribution, although it sounds like it would be stronger, um, are in fact easier to do with point charges on our nuclear centered models than the vacuum phase charge distribution. So you might have been seeing in that last slide there was sort of a cyclical process and in, indeed it was, it was an iterate to convergence sort of thing because with the polarized charge distribution, if you polarize the, the charges in that molecule, what we were doing was we were getting a bath of solvent molecules and doing MD simulations to um, to uh, get an average equilibrium solvent charge density and then use that in the quantum calculation in the QMMM sense to, uh, to induce the molecule to polarize and then measure you know, what would the polarized uh, charge distribution come out to be. Well, um, if you've changed the initial charge distribution in, in your molecular mechanics model, then the solvent charge distribution is going to change a little bit and you have to do that iterate to convergence. Similarly, with the, uh, the torsion fitting, um, what we were doing is looking at, well, there's, there's a lot of different uh, parameters here to fit. Um, 
as we, you know, as we uh, do more and more of this, the, the generational learning in this case that we were doing was, um, let's make a molecular mechanics model that perfectly uh, or as close as possible uh, mimics the quantum mechanical energy surface over the configuration space that that molecular mechanics model is going to explore in a simulation. So we would fit a force field, and then we would do molecular mechanics optimizations to those same uh, configurations, and then um, uh, recalculate QM energies for those re-optimized uh, configurations and see, okay, did our model learn correctly? Did it actually track the QM surface as, it, as we allowed it to drive the molecular configuration into a new state? And by doing that, so we had another sort of generational learning, a cyclical process, but we were doing this all uh, in conjunction with the IPOL-Q protocol. And by the first time I had, I had done a uh, torsion uh, fit for this new polarized charge set or this semi-polarized charge set, I realized, okay, we have all this gas phase quantum data, but we have polarized charges. And the polarized charges, the, the internal electrostatic energy is a part of the energy surface. So what do we do? And the answer that I came up with, which sort of really started the I Q line, was that, okay, we do have two charge sets. We have to look at them individually, even though we're gonna combine them. Uh, we have to say, okay, take the gas phase charges and use those during the torsion fitting. We're gonna to fit torsion parameters in the context of those gas phase charges using gas phase quantum data. And then we're gonna transfer those, to, uh, those torsion parameters to work in concert with the polarized charge set and do our simulations. And so that, you know, wheels within wheels sort of validation process rolled forward. And the first thing that came out was FF14 IPQ, uh, as you, you can see in this timeline here. Uh, it was all, this is all least squares uh, torsion fitting, it's least squares electrostatic potential fitting. So it's, it's a one-off, uh, you, 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 you fit the force field, but then you have to let the force field drive the molecule and see where it's gonna take things and then make new fitting data. And that's where, again, the cyclical process is coming from. So we, um, we went through a lot of the, the formalities of how we do the, uh, the IPOQ line. And I made a sort of a disastrous mistake with refitting some of the Leonard Jones in too harsh a manner. But um, Carl Debiak is the one who caught this. So after in 2014 publishing 14 IPQ, he called me up and said, you know, I think, I, I, I think there's something wrong. And I said, I think you're right. I, I've been seeing a lot of stickiness, like side chains sticking to backbones and things starting to unfold where they shouldn't. And he said, well, I think I know what's wrong. And I said, I think you're right. So what we did was we rolled back a lot of the Leonard Jones refitting and we, we put it all instead on the polar hydrogens. Um, we got a preliminary 15 IPQ and we had all this infrastructure in place. So in only three months or so, uh, we were able to go down here and incorporate a lot of new uh, torsions, lots and lots of new data. We had nearly a quarter million data points, um, single point calculations on various uh, dipeptide, tripeptide uh, uh, residues. And um, then we had, uh, three months later, we had our finalized um, 15 IPQ force build, which like I said is, you know, it's very competitive in terms of its performance, but there's, a very, there's also a very high bar to meet in terms of the way um, biomolecular force fields for proteins behave these days. So one thing that we did along, along the way uh, was to incorporate this, these angle refinements. So we weren't just um, working with torsion refinements anymore. We were also doing least squares optimization of the angles. And again, this is all done in one big matrix fitting. The angles and the torsions are all fitted simultaneously. Um, it really does appear that the angle uh, refitting did, um, did a lot of good for not just the secondary structure stability, but also things like these alanine five J couplings. So this is uh, really looking at, um, it's looking at backbone uh, propensities, things that will sort of evolve into secondary structure as you get from a five mer to a 10 mer and a 15 mer, things like that. But uh, 15 IPQ is one of the first force fields to get below one uh, mean chi-squared value in, in any of these, uh, by any of these metrics, these carpless uh, coefficients, depending on which set you choose, you may or may not get different answers. Um, but the uh, uh, 15 IPQ force field did extremely well by uh, several of these metrics uh, in, in, getting the, uh, yeah, in getting these J-couplings uh, covered. And just in case anyone's wondering, well, how did you fit the angles? We were fitting both equilibria as well as the stiffness constants. The stiffness constants, fitting those things, it's, it's pretty obvious because it's just like fitting a torsion amplitude. 
but in order to fit the equilibrium, so we're, we're, we're not saying the angle has got to be 109. It could be 104, 114. Least squares are going to figure that out. And the way that works is um, there's two parabolas, two basis functions. The sum of two parabolas is another parabola. And OK, you can see the, the black here, the black line, the, the minimum the value of the minimum actually changed. While well, the position of the minimum changed, but the, the overall height of the minimum changed, the steepness of the parabola is, is a consequence that we're fitting. But um, in order to uh, account for the fact that uh, the, the value, uh, the, the, the tide um, changed for these models, um, we have one additional constant uh, essentially per system that, that um, pretty much obviates all of that. So, um, all of this is being taken care of. We just have two basis functions, and we are fitting um, with complete mathematical rigor the, um, the equilibrium value as well as the stiffness of these angles. And so then we can look at things like alpha helical propensity in K19. We'll look at alpha helical propensity in uh, uh, the FF19SB force field as well. Uh, the only thing I can say here that's you know, particularly successful, it's a little bit shy of the 40% target. We want these things, in fact, to be metastable. And in fact, we do see the helix unfolding and then refolding at various times in the simulation. I still think that you know, the, the overall propensity may be even less than we measured. We did throw out the first microsecond of these runs uh, in order to measure it, but it's, you know, it's, it's very difficult to, to look at these things and think, okay, we do need enhanced sampling and probably even something on the tens of microseconds uh, time scale for each of these temperatures to really understand exactly what's going on here. And in the later slide, I'll show you that for FF19SB, that is what they did. Uh, beta sheet propensity, again, you know, we're, we're getting beta sheets folding and unfolding. This thing is supposed to be about 50% folded at 295 Kelvin. Uh, I think it's, again, a little bit shy, but it's, uh, it's ballpark, you know, and we, we do see transient um, uh, stability of this thing. So this is, this is actually all very, very good news, especially considering we've completely refitted the charge set. We've completely refitted the torsion set and uh, some of the angle parameters as well. So this is, uh, this is as different a force field. This is completely sui generis. And finally, I'm just going to review a trip cage folding we got with this thing. We, we did get about the right melting temperature for trip cage. It's, about, it's supposed to melt around 300, 305. And we see it, you know, that's about what we see happening. For FF14SB, uh, the contemporary to 15 IPQ, uh, they also got about um, a 305 to 310 uh, melting temperature. So again, these are both the force fields derived by very different methods. They're all different parameters, uh, perhaps save for a few of the bonded parameters and some of the heavy out of Leonard Jones. Uh, but they're very, very different force fields. They get very similar results. And we can ask a question. So if we run, run way back here and look at this, so right, I've got polarized charge set, and I've got a gas phase charge set, and I did this funny thing of fitting the torsions in the conjunct, you know, in concert, in the context of the gas phase charges, and then I combine them with the polarized charges to actually do simulations. Well, what if I had just run with the gas phase charges? Because everyone tends to take a charge set and then fit torsions in the context of that charge set and then roll. Well, if I had done that, in fact, we, we did this study. Uh, we did trip cage as well as a number of other, um, just repeating the validation that we had done for 15 IPQ in a follow-up. Um, if we take just the um, vacuum phase charges, the yellow line that you see here, trip cage is melting way too early. In fact, it's already melting at 285 Kelvin. I'm sorry, I don't have the temperatures on these plots, but uh, the one in the upper left here again is uh, 275. And so then 285, it's still melting 295. We didn't see a melting event, but it looks like at the very end here we might have. One might have started. And then for all the other temperatures, it melts. Well, what if we had done which is essentially the 14SB uh, fitting protocol, take the polarized charges, fit torsions in the context of the polarized charges with gas phase data and run simulations. If we had done that, uh, things actually do look better, but um, if we had just followed that protocol strictly and again, making an ab initio force field that way without any intervention, without, you know, again, many graduate students looking over the thing and making sure things are all right, um, we still got some problems. Okay, so the, uh, the 15 IPQ QSOL, that is a fake force field made with what I think is the wrong protocol. It turned out to be slightly worse than the canonical protocol that we, uh, that we uh, put forward. 
So in, in fact, you know, we did see a melting event at 275 Kelvin. We didn't see anything else bad until about, um, you know, any other melting until about 315 Kelvin. And so, you know, we can, th there was this and there was some, a uh, uh, little less stability in a uh, GB3 protein. It's a small globular protein. But from, what, from this, what we can say is that um, the way we made 15 IPQ, using the polarized charge set in simulations, but training uh, torsion and bonded parameters with the vacuum-based charge set, that was the best option of the, these three. You know, certainly you need a polarized charge set. That's, that's a given from, from this and other data we collected. Having the polarized charge set seems to be, um, no matter how you did the torsions, seems to be the bulk of the, uh, of the um, battle there. You know, once you've got that polarized charge set, the way you fitted the torsions, uh, there is some consequence to it, but in fact, just having the charges be polarized ensures a lot of uh, tertiary structure is maintained in these simulations. So then I do wanna um, not just toot my own horn for, uh, for this entire talk, but I wanna mention some of the latest work that's been done in the Simulink group, which is this very impressive FF19 SB force field. This is a CMAP based force field. I'm gonna talk more about CMAPs a little bit later. But um, they did uh, the CMAP fitting, and I, I have to commend them for, uh, for how they did it or for the effort they put into doing it um, and the, the ambition they had because essentially they had 9,000 parameters and they came out with a force field that doesn't appear to be too overfitted. So this is, I think this is a very good thing. Carlos is quite circumspect when he talks about this saying, well, we think it's better than 14 SB. I think he's correct. Uh, I think you know, this, this is a very, again, a very solid uh, product from the Simulink group. From this slide here, this is helical propensity. This slide represents 5,000 microseconds, so five milliseconds of MD across about 80 different um, uh, simulations or 80 different systems, each amino acid, uh, a helix of each amino acid. Um, and uh, with these uh, four different force field combinations. So the OPC water model is a four point water. It's, it, it's a funny looking water model, but in a lot of ways, it seems to have a lot of the right properties. So we'd like to see you know, proteins behave correctly in the context of that better water model than this old TIP3P that doesn't even work with Ewald. But um, when you finally run these things out to tens of microseconds per system, you can start to see, in fact, the water model does have an effect on the secondary structure. You know, we, we say it doesn't, you know, it has only a minor effect on the hydration free energies and such. Well, it does have a noticeable effect in the long run on the secondary structure. And in fact, um, 19SB, uh, this combination with OPC, you, you might be a cynic and say, okay, well, it's because um, aspartate or maybe glutamate uh, fell in the right spot. And you know, otherwise, uh, had, that, had that not happened, you, know, you would have seen something very similar to 14SB. If only aspartate and glutamate had been in the right spots for that one, um, that would have been a, you know, a pretty um, tight to the trend line sort of, uh, sort of slope as well. But um, I think you know, and it's, it's encouraging to see that all the effort they put into 19SB and to see a better model like this, they didn't just refit torsions or replace torsions with CMAPs in that force field. They, they also took into account, they, they changed all the side chain torsions and they were taking into account some of these arguments I was making on the previous slides, but they came up with their own solution to it, which I think is probably even a better solution which is they um, incorporated solvation effects in the torsion fitting by finding a DFT method that um, looked very similar to uh, GB uh, or GBSA um, energetics. So the, um, the, the GBSA energy or energy profile, the solution uh, phase energy of these molecules, they found a DFT method along with a solvation correction that tracked that pretty closely and then they used that DFT method with solvation correction to do all of their torsion scans. And then consequently, they used the GBSA as part of the internal energy against which they were fitting all those torsions. So in the context of all that, they have their torsions fitted in, you know, in the context of some sort of solvation effect. And I think that um, probably had a very positive uh, influence on their overall result. So now I'm going to transition to a little bit of just talking about options for improving these biomolecular force fields. And the, the ones that really jump out before we go to polarization and things that will make it take at least four times as long to do a simulation, uh, you can have additional monopoles. 
uh, to whatever limited degree you want. So we can transition something like tip 3 p or SPC into tip 5 p Or you can have these tabulated potentials, these CMAP terms. You can uh, you could turn dihedral cosine series into um, cubic spline-based map functions. And the other uh, route that you can go is you can improve the fitting process. So make the model more elaborate or improve the fitting process. We've talked a lot about incorporating these solvation effects. Uh, also, could we, when we think about the fitting, if we just do a least squares fit, we get one answer. We get the optimum uh, least squares answer. But could we do a genetic algorithm or something around there? Could we find ways to um, conditions to perturb the least squares fit that we would actually get many degenerate solutions, some of which in fact are very different from one another, but all come very close in terms of the same figure of merit. So if we could do that, we could perhaps prune them um, using a diversity of different solutions to the entire molecular mechanics parameter set, uh, prune those using experimental data and perhaps pick the winner. So the first thing to look at is, uh, I'm gonna look at these uh, extra points for elaborating the model. These are uh, six frame styles of extra points. And extra points in simulations, sometimes called virtual sites, they do not have any maps, but they, uh, their positions are entirely determined as a consequence of the uh, positions of frame atoms that do have mass. So if water is the frame atom, you've got the oxygen being the parent atom probably, and you've got the two hydrogens being the other frame atoms. Uh, the simplest style here, style one, this is really good for putting things along a bond vector if you want charges there, which is actually a very good option. But it's also um, viable to do something like a sigma hole for, uh, for an organic halide. So to put um, an extra slightly positive charge out beyond the chlorine on a carbon-chlorine bond along that bond vector, you're actually putting a positive charge out beyond what you think is a very electronegative chlorine atom and that's creating what's called the sigma hole. And that does very, very well, in fact, for improving electrostatic potential fits as well as hydration free energies. I'm not gonna to go too much into that, but that's a, that's a real success in terms of the way uh, extra points can improve hydration free energies. Otherwise, the hydration free energies for these small molecules are largely a consequence of the overall dipole and improving the electrostatic potential fit using these extra points does not change the overall dipole of molecule that much. So there are select cases in which case these the extra points do improve hydration free energies. What I'm hoping is overall we can improve the, the details, the nuances of the electrostatic potentials to get either better hydrogen bonding um, propensities or, uh, or also you know, just better, as a consequence, better secondary structure propensities. You can look through all these other frames here. Um, I really encourage people to look at the Gromax manual. That's where virtually all of this stuff came from. All of these things will now be implemented in the PMEMD package. They are in the code in a, in a working branch, and they will be incorporated probably as a patch in, somewhere in the middle of the AMBER 20 release cycle. So when we think about these extra points, um, a lot of people initially default to, okay, these are Lewis structures, right? Or we can make Lewis structures out of them. And this is what I, what I think of as sort of taking the freshman chemistry off-ramp in the computational chemistry. And I think this comes about as a consequence of the fact that we have a lot of people that are, who are very well versed in mathematics, they know a lot of computational science, they may not have actually taken as much um, chemistry in college. But the, uh, you know, it's not to say that, you know, we've got lots and lots of education, but the, the, um, the weight of that mathematical background, I think, sort of tends to pull us towards these, uh, these other models. So tip 5P, it's actually no, not really much more successful than tip 4P, even though, most uh, chemists would not think to put a, you know, to put a uh, lone pair somewhere like at the, uh, at the, you know, at, at a site sort of like in the elbow of that water molecule. But um, if you're looking only at these freshman chemistry positions, you're kind of missing out on a lot of the stuff you could do with extra points. So if, you, if the electrostatic uh, potential fit is your figure of merit, the lone pair Lewis structure positions often do not have that much of an effect, even in sulfur, where you've got the lone pairs as well as a quadrupole. Um, you're still even a little bit better off putting things along the bond centers. And it's kind of surprising, but in some sense, that's where a lot of the electrons are in these molecules as well. So many extra points can have a moderate effect on the accuracy of that electrostatic potential fitting. If you have, say, 50% more particles in your monopole distribution. So you have extra points along a number of the bond vectors, particularly in the polar groups. 
uh, you've improved, you've increased the cost of your, of your simulation by a factor of perhaps two, um, but you have uh, improved the fitting of the electrostatic potential by up to 40%. So how much effect that has on the accuracy, not just of hydration free energies, but again, again of hydrogen bonding uh, propensities, we'll have to see. No one's ever really made a, an extensive extra points force field for general biopolymers. Uh, there is a sugars extra point force field that seems to perform uh, better than a nuclear charge only force field that works very well with TIP5P. But um, again, the, these are, it's, it's about 10 or 15 years old. There's, there have been a lot of simulations with it since, uh, but there's a lot more development to be done in this area. The other um, way to elaborate these models that I, I want to do a little more of a deep dive into is these CMAPs. So these are, you know, a CMAP is basically a tabulated potential, and you're going to do cubic spline interpolation between the tabulated grid points. If you look in any topology that has CMAPs, it gives you the values at the grid points, and then the program is kind of trusted to fill in the details, figure out how the cubic spline interpolation works, and roll with it. And um, that it sort of tells you right there that all that matters are the values of the grid points, right? So if we know those, um, how do we get everything else? Well, the, you know, the question is, okay, if we have some point anywhere in space, how do we then go back to the values of the grid points and figure out what the exact value at our point of interest is? Because that's, you know, we have a particular phi psi uh, position on the Ramachandran plot. How do we figure out what the value of this CMAP is given all these grid points? Well, here is my cubic interpolation. Here's the formula for it all. And um, you can see here that uh, if you just, you know, you, you have to plug in, you know, fill in, plug in, um, uh, given all these definitions here. But this is the, the concise compact form. If you look in the code itself, uh, in AMBER or in CHARM, you're going to see a big 16 by 16 matrix doing this uh, matrix multiply. This is a more compact way to say the same thing. Okay, but uh, what you can see here is that you need the values at the four surrounding grid points. So those would be, you know, you can see these four surrounding grid points around here. You need delta X and delta Y within the one bin. And then you need to know the values of the derivative, uh, the derivative in X or the derivative in Y, and the cross derivative, uh, DX, DY, uh, at each of those four grid points. Okay, so once you know all those things, all the corner values, then you can do your matrix uh, multiplication. You can come out with this A matrix and you can multiply it by your powers of delta X. And of course, one is delta X to the zero. One is delta Y to the zero. And with this big matrix vector multiply, you come out with a scalar. You know, the, the, the power or the um, value at delta X, delta Y uh, comes out from this big old formula. So it, essentially what this is saying is if I know the values of the grid, and I know the derivatives at the grid points, I know what the value is anywhere in space. Well, that's interesting because then if I wanted to fit a CMAP, um, I might need, you, naively you'd think, okay, I need to know the values of the function at all the grid points. And well, we're gonna see why that's actually trickier than it sounds a little bit later. But I'm gonna show you uh, my friend Ariana. She knows a lot of math, okay? And this is something that uh, she taught me about how to do um, cubic spline fitting and interpolation and thereby fit a um, cubic spline interpolated map using arbitrary data. So essentially give me data anywhere in space as long as it covers the map with reasonable uh, density. I'm going to tell you what the ideal map should be to get that data. So let's put her in between LeBron and James and Dua and Abel and Enrique, and Selena, and Arnold, and Ellie, okay? And but for the um, small perturbation caused by, the, caused by James in this case, which will not be a disaster, we could trace a cubic spline function over the tops of each of their heads, and it's practically symmetric. So Ariana can just look up and say, oh, the derivative at her point is zero, okay? It, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of a, just a symmetry argument, it's a no-brainer. What happens though, if we mix up all these people? Now is Ariana gonna get worried? Well, she knows a lot of math, so her formula is gonna be, you come over here, you look at the height of the guy next to you, and you multiply by this constant I'm showing here. And then you go, go to the other side, and you, you know, multiply by the negative of that constant, 
and you take, you know, you multiply this guy's height by the negative of that constant. And Ariane is just gonna keep going like this, side to side, if you will. And she can apply this stencil to get the value, in fact, of her derivative. So she's multiplying by this one constant you see here and powers of this constant you see at the bottom. So it's an exponentially decreasing uh, contribution from the heights of each of these people further and further away from her that determines what her derivative is going to be. But again, her derivative is entirely a function of the heights of all the other people at these equally spaced positions around her. Now, Selena can do the same thing, in fact. Selena can apply the same stencil. She's just gonna look left and right, left and right, left and right. Um, Ellie might be able to do the same thing. We're getting really close to the boundary, though, and Arnold is gonna realize, oh, he cannot terminate the series. But Dua has new rules, and they sort of speak to the general case. So um, with that, uh, with the general case, which I'm not gonna go into too much because it's um, not needed for periodic boundary conditions, but for some of the boundary conditions I'll talk about later, it is. Uh, I worked all this out, or actually Ariana helped me work all this out. And with these formulas, you can make stencils to get the derivatives at any point, any grid point, as a function of the values of your, of your tabulated function at all of the other grid points. Okay, and so that, that implies by all of this math here, you just run it back through this big long series of equations, plug and chug, uh, the surface value anywhere is a linear combination of the values everywhere. Okay, and so what this looks like in practice, you can imagine um, if you're right on a grid point, well, what's the value of your function? It's 100% the value at that grid point. If you start to step off the grid point, you start to have slight positive dependence on um, your, your nearest neighbor values. And as you get directly you know, over here on the very right, if you, if you get right in between four grid points, uh, the value of your function is an average of the four corners and then a little contribution from um, ones further out. And what you're seeing here is kind of like, it's like a wavelet distribution, okay? But uh, in fact, the, the value at any arbitrary point depends on the values at all of the grid points um, with exponentially decreasing um, decreasing uh, importance. If you have like a 64 by 64 grid, you can clip this series at 30 uh, grid points uh, in any direction. And if you do, if you clip it right there, you've already got your answer to machine precision, in fact. So this is a very interesting way if you have, if you have to spline tabulate something that you already know at regular intervals, you don't have to recalculate the values at very, very small discretizations and take a numerical derivative or something like that. You can actually just take the, the values you've already got if your function was very expensive to compute and you can get your um, to within FP64 machine precision the correct answer just by looking at those values. It's, it's really remarkable, but that's how it works. That's the math. So the upshot of this is that, again, I said naively, if you wanted to fit a CMAP, you might think you need to put your protein at every one of these grid points in Ramachandran space and nail it there, and then look at the energies and see what you got. If you try to do that, what you quickly realize is that, well, you can't quite restrain your molecule to any of these particular grid points. It doesn't want to stay there, and even if you put harmonic restraints on it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to drift off just a little bit. Now, you could get really tricky, and you could say, okay, well, I'm going to you know, move the restraints around the origin point of the restraints so that in fact, all the molecules do fall on the grid points. That would be very laborious, but you could do it. Um, what FF19SB actually rolled forward with was something like, uh, like the orange plot here. They had things that were very close to the grid points and in fact, close enough, I would say. Again, they still got very good results in their simulations, but they were rolling with this and thinking that they had to snap those values to the grid points. And what um, Ariana's math is telling us, though, is actually you could have something like this green data set, which um, not, uh, not coincidentally just looks a lot like the, um, the Ramachandra distribution of a canonical amino acid. Uh, but you could have amino acids in their native configurations. As long as you've got a smattering of coverage elsewhere um, all over the space, you don't want to leave big gaps in your data, like two, uh, two grid spacings. That's, that's about as far as I would go. But as long as you have decent coverage and you have enough data points to inform what your map should be, any data set will actually do, and it's just as valid as any other. So here are some glycine fitted C maps. I have my own uh, force field fitting code, again, which is what uh, Carl Debiak and Anthony Bogetti have been using to fit um, their force fields. 
Uh, but I've taught it to do the CMAPs now. Uh, and again, the CMAPs, they're being done uh, alongside in the same least square fit as all the other torsions and all the angle parameters. So you do not have to fit one set of parameters and then another on top of it and keep propagating the air that way. It's all done in one fell swoop. But we can compare like the FF19SB glycine CMAP uh, to the ones that I fitted using some data. I just plucked the data from the FF15 IPQ training set. So there are some differences you can see in the, in the spacing of the, of the two blue peaks here uh, in the middle. And that's probably largely a consequence of the fact that the data is different. I mean, I was using a different um, quantum method, mine's in vacuum, and theirs uh, is, in a, is in a solution phase environment. But um, it's, I think it's remarkable about 19SB, their map is very nearly symmetrical, except for a few um, small points here, which I'm showing in these, um, in these difference plots to the right of each of the C maps. Uh, they did a very, very good job of, you know, uh, curating and, um, you know, massaging and making sure these, uh, these configurations were well, were well optimized, well relaxed. They got a very symmetric map overall for glycine. Now, obviously, you don't expect symmetry in something like alanine or any of the other amino acids, but for glycine, you should see this, um, this twofold symmetry. The only place I really recover that well, even with 6,000 data points, spread all over the map is in the eight by eight C map. So I, uh, I've made my fitting program so that I can fit eight by eight, 12 by 12, six by six. Um, and if you take that, you can make a 24 by 24 map out of any of those things without losing any of the information. So that's, that's what the code is essentially doing. It's publishing 24 by 24 C maps, even though I've fitted eight by eight or 12 by 12. You can see the 24 by 24 C map is wrinkled as a prune, it's definitely overfitted. But even the 12 by 12, the, the, you're seeing a lot of loss of symmetry, despite the fact that I got 6,000 data points for only 144 fitted parameters. So the upshot here is that we have to be very careful how we design this data set. But I think uh, probably overall a 12 by 12 map is a good compromise in terms of the, uh, the detail it can capture. Uh, it, in terms of the figure of merit, just getting the RMSE to these quantum uh, energies, 12 by 12 is about as good as you can get. 24 by 24 is slightly better, but not much. It's very, very marginal. And again, the overfitting um, risk gets very, very high. So lastly, I just want to look at, you know, what can CMAPs do in terms of the RMS error? How can they help improve our figure of merit? Well, just looking at the FF19SB uh, torsion uh, set. Okay, so FF19SB deleted some torsions and replaced them with CMAPs. If I instead said, okay, no, put those torsions back, delete the CMAPs, um, these are the RMS errors I would get for various systems along the x-axis here, okay? And I've just ranked them in terms of uh, their overall ease of fitting. Mostly like the single amino acid residues are down here on, on the left, and as you get further to the right, you get the charged amino acids and then the multi-residue uh, systems that I had in this. Uh, but this, this data actually comes, um, the fitting data is coming from the FF15 IPQ data set. I'm fitting it with the FF19SB torsion space, okay? And so then if I, if I, fit, um, uh, if I fit new CMAPs using the FF19SB CMAP space, that's when I get this blue and, or this purple and orange line. So this is the effect of the CMAPs. In almost all the cases, they are doing better than the torsions. And you know, by about half a kcal to up to, you know, uh, to up to one kcal per mole per system. However, if I um, hit it with an even larger torsion space, so FF19SB actually truncated the torsion space quite a bit. They, they, they compacted a lot of their atom types back into one. They had this diversification in 14SB that they sort of uh, rolled back. And I think that was the right move for 19SB. Um, 15 IPQ, we, we went forward and maybe even pushed the diversification a little bit further. So if you have a very vast torsion space as opposed to a CMAP space, what do we get? Well, the, the FF19, uh, I, uh, FF19SB CMAP space, again, does this, this blue and uh, this, this purple and orange line. And then the FF15 IPQ torsion space actually seems to beat the CMAPs in some of these larger systems. But this is, again, this is like a beware kind of thing because it may indicate that 15 IPQ is overfitted especially in these larger systems where we didn't have as much sampling and it was finding ways to cheat perhaps in the larger systems at the expense of the smaller systems, which you can see that the expanded torsion space still does not do as well as the CMAPs on. Now, 
and just to just to assure anyone who still likes to use 15 IPQ, um, this is not the entirety of the fitting data for 15 IPQ. There was a generational learning process in there, so I was using basically just the first generation of data, not the subsequent stuff. So this is 150,000 data points that you see across various systems. There were 250,000 data points in the entire uh, training set for the finished 15 IPQ. So hopefully some of this overfitting has been dealt with and we, we did see some of that effect during our fitting. Um, but you know, this is the, the moral here is we need to understand what the overfitting problem really is because when we step into CMAPs, we're talking, if you look at CMAPs for 16 um, amino acids and you combine things like, you know, uh, if you combine things like phenylalanine and tyrosine into one, one CMAP, um, you've got 9,000 parameters there, potentially. So we need to understand how much we can afford, how much um, fitting we can afford to do, and maybe what overfitting problem do we already have that we didn't understand. So I just want to wrap up by proposing some strategies in the bottom uh, polymer force field development. Uh, I think at least for, uh, for our purposes for open force field, we want to make our own biopolymer force field. We are porting some of the amber force fields into uh, open FF format right now. Uh, but uh, for our own force field, just, to, just to, to have a product that we demonstrate, you know, we can, we can apply our methods to create a viable uh, biopolymer force field that is um, expansible and easily incorporates, um, again, the hundreds of potentially unnatural amino acids. Uh, I think we should stick with common sets of um, nitrogen, hydrogen, carbon, oxygen backbone charges, very much like the Cornell chart sets done. And uh, what we had to do with 15 IPQ, we found that to be the best choice. Uh, then for if we have non-native uh, residues, we should also um, pick some uh, common atoms there and have some common chart sets. Then pair those with common sets of backbone torsions. And really the, the reason to have common backbone charges um, is to make it so that the common backbone torsions can have an easier time fitting uh, their part of the problem. Uh, Li Ping and I have been discussing, uh, we think that B3 lip with, uh, I was using minimally augmented, but a, a DEF2 uh, TZVPP um, uh, basis set, I'm also I didn't have it in the slide here, but um, Beck Johnson uh, D3 and dispersion corrections, and we think that's a, that's a good balance of all, the, um, of all the different forces that we need. And I would suggest using you know, tripeptides as well as even some tetrapeptides, uh, particularly for the charges. Uh, when you've got um, this YAA, this, uh, that's any amino acid uh, of the serine, glycine, valine, alanine. So I'm, I'm putting a, a polar amino acid in there, I'm putting a glycine in there, but really making it so that your amino acid of interest, the X amino acid in the center there, uh, it doesn't know um, always what is to either side of it when you're um, doing these charge set fits. So I think that's important. And I think it's also important to have a lot of confirmations of each of the amino acids. So in making the common sets of backbone charges and torsion parameters, I think we should extend that idea to DNA and RNA. Probably a similar, a similar level of quantum theory uh, will be sufficient. And then for carbohydrates, uh, assigning common charges uh, you know, to, to each of the four most common elements uh, based on what their neighboring atoms are. So carbon um, double bonded to another carbon with a nitrogen on the other side, or carbon to a carbon to another carbon. You know, you, you can see all these different permutations. There are probably at least two or 300 um, unique charges you could fit there, but I think we should probably try for something like that and then do a direct fit to, you know, to ESP quantum data. We can, we can talk about making the AM1BCC-like charge set or some sort of bond charge correction thing for, um, for a even more expansive carbohydrate force field after that. But I think it's, it's quite feasible to, to take a few hundred common carbohydrate monomers and look at the different ways carbon, oxygen, and nitrogen can come together along with different hydroxyl groups and figure out um, some common charges, but a set of a few hundred common charges to fit for that. And then future directions for force field development. I want to uh, dip back on this uh, the CMAPs idea because now that we know how to fit CMAPs and they're actually not as scary uh, as the uh, the people who you know when making FF19 SB, I have to commend them for their ambition because again, looking at 9,000 parameters, how are you going to do it? And having to generate the data with it as as meticulous as they had to be about it, um, it's not nearly as scary as they had to deal with. And so now that we know how to fit the CMAPs and we know how to fit essentially any tabulated function. Well, 
let's think about, um, you know, it would be great if all our bonded parameters were good enough to just interpret raw quantum data. And we don't have to do this reoptimization. One of the things I've not mentioned at all in this talk is that when you take a torsion drive, what you're actually doing is doing a molecular mechanics optimization to relax away um, orthogonal, or what we hope are orthogonal degrees of freedom, so we can isolate just the torsion or the set of torsions that we want to fit. Well, that changes the coordinates. So the coordinates from the molecular mechanics calculation give you an energy, and they correspond to an energy from the quantum calculation, but this is all being done because the quantum and molecular mechanics models don't agree in terms of what the, the bond and angle, the high frequency degrees of freedom, the way those should behave. But what if our molecular mechanics parameters were, were good enough to follow the quantum model wherever it goes? Well, that would mean all we have to do is take the quantum optimized coordinates and feed them right into the molecular mechanics model, and you've got it. Now, for the IPQ force fields, what we were doing, uh, and which actually works in some sense surprisingly, is we were feeding molecular mechanics optimized coordinates into quantum single point calculations. And what we were doing, you know, that we were justified in that saying, well, this is where the molecular mechanics model is going to go in a simulation. So wherever it goes, let's just make sure that it, it's still tracking what the quantum energy of that surface would be. You know, there's still a quantum energy, it's just not where the quantum model would necessarily have it go if quantum were driving the whole thing. But if, if we could make our molecular mechanics models better, which I think is you know, sort of getting into this class two force field idea. You have, a, um, you have bond and bond angle synapse. So with those things, we could probably have enough detail to make these molecular mechanics models track the quantum very tightly. And then what we can do is, um, first of all, it would accelerate force balance um, fittings tremendously for, for very, very big data sets. There's no ambiguity into what coordinates and what energy you meant. Um, so everyone's going to look and they're going to download the data set and they would look at it pretty much the same way. But the, the real advantage, I think, is we would be able to train to gradients at particular atoms. So we know, we know what the force on this atom is supposed to be. We don't have to combine all the terms together and get an energy where you can have all sorts of compensatory effects. We know what every atom gradient should be and we have 30 times as much data coming out of every quantum calculation. So then uh, in a very long view, you could even look at these synapses as a way to perhaps do hydrogen bonding. I mean, Dave Baker's group has been very successful with their you know, Rosetta program and their tabulated hydrogen bonding potential. I think it's only about 12 grid points or so. Um, I think they probably do a cubic spline interpolation of some sort, but again, any data set that has reasonable coverage of what hydrogen bonds look like could be enough. Now there's a lot of wrinkles here because uh, the different hydrogen bonds, it all happens in the context of fitted charges and who knows you know what the fitted charges on this polar hydrogen or that one might be how would you fit a common set of hydrogen bonding surfaces for that well that, that's that's why this is sort of a long uh, long view in the future kind of thing but I think it's it's time to start looking at this because once you have bond bond angle C maps a hydrogen bond C map is hardly any different so with that, I would like to uh, acknowledge some of the people I work with at Rutgers. I'd like to also acknowledge well, uh, NVIDIA. Um, a lot of the people there have been very, very helpful for getting AMBER into the, the state that it is and allowing us to simulate at the level the microsecond time scales that we do. And uh, Scott Legrand is a person, he's an absolutely brilliant guy. He's, um, I'm sorry, he's not at Amazon. He's now back at NVIDIA. Brilliant guy, a little bit fickle, but a brilliant guy. And we're very, very glad to have him uh, working with us again on the AMBER team. Thank you all.